disruption of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Welcome back to you all. I hope you have your fans at the ready. I hope you are sufficiently caffeinated for the final leg of this afternoon's session, where we will have an engaging discussion about the EU's love for startups and SMEs as part of this year's Competitive Europe Summit brought to you by Politico Live. My name is Samuel Stolton. I'm a reporter at Politico covering competition and tech, and I'll be moderating this afternoon's panel where we shall explore the EU's plans to facilitate access to capital for companies that wish to expand, how much risk the EU is taking in financing emerging technological projects, and the relevance of other initiatives in the EU's broader goals here, such as the Capital Markets Union and broader public private partnerships. To discuss all of this and more, we are very pleased to be joined by a range of those working at the forefront of these issues today. Joining us virtually, we have Carme Artigas, Secretary of State for Digitalization and Artificial Intelligence in Spain, Laurie Fleuret, Deputy Director at La French Tech, we also have Jean-Laurent Granier, Chief Executive Officer at Generali France, and Jean-David Malot, Director at the European Innovation Council and Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises Executive Agency at the European Commission. For those of you in attendance, both in person and online, we'd love to pose some of your questions to the panel this afternoon. So please log in to the Swapcard app and submit your questions there. And don't forget to get involved in the debate on Twitter using the hashtag Politico Competition. So, without further ado, I think we're just about ready to jump into our discussion this afternoon. And perhaps we could turn to you, Carme, in Spain, and um, tell us a bit about the picture of how things are going over there at the moment, because you've made efforts, of course, to increase the digitalization of SMEs, and you're very much pitching yourself as a startup nation. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about what's going on in Spain. Yes, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, great panel uh, with my colleagues. And yes, as you have mentioned, for us, SMEs is a, a very important priority. First of all, because in the Spanish economy, uh, SMEs have a very important weight. They account for 98% of total number of companies and employ more than 60% of the workers. So the transformation of our productive model into towards a more digital economy implies necessarily the modernization of SMBs. We need to boost their efficiency, their productivity, their competitiveness, and their international expansion. So the key project for this digitalization of SMBs is what we call the SMB digitalization plan that has 4.6 million euros from the next generation EU funds with the goal to digitalize 1 million SMBs. And taking this into account, we really expect that digital transformation can increase the productivity of Spanish SMBs by 15, 25%. So we have deployed a, a very particular program out of these uh, 4.6 million euros. We are devoting 3 million euros to the digital toolkit program. This is an economic aid program that allows SMEs to access a large catalog of digital solutions as a service, uh, cloud-based, uh, that we, they we can subscribe along one year. So it's not like one-off investment and one-off payment. It's enrolling them in one, one year uh, transformational journey. So just in order to be able to have this level of capillarity, because the challenge as a, as, a, as a public administration is not only to mobilize this huge amount of money, but also to make it uh, 
really accessible and targeted to the right to the right companies. So we had beforehand we could be able to deploy this program. We had a very important internal modernization project at the uh, electronic administration level. So we have operationalized all the documentation that we are traditionally asking the SME when they ask for a subsidy. And for example, in Spain, you need to ask the SMEs to provide 36 documents before they can apply for a subsidy. So thanks to our investment in artificial intelligence and aerobic process automation, we have been able to ask them zero papers, zero document. We are accessing them absolutely online and we are also collaborating with the private sector in validating the, the, the legible uh, documentation. So the success is huge. We have just launched the first tranche of the program. It's 500 million euros for companies between 10 and 49 employers. And in two months, we have already uh, resolved 62,000 subsidies in weeks. And uh, that accounts for more than 60% of the potential target. So it is a success, an unprecedented success of any other program. We have heard about not in our country, on another country. We traditionally have a level of acceptance of maximum 25-30% of a subsidy from the potential users and those who effectively ask that subsidy. So we have already in just two months, 62,000 companies that accounts that they receive a bonus of 12,000 euros to spend it on this marketplace. And now already have delivered 123 million euros in this year and in two months. And they can spend that not in one, two, 10, 50, 100 potential providers, but in 8,000 registered digitalization agents. So the SMBs are recipient of the bonus, but they can spend it in another SMB that can be their digitalization provider. So the key success factor has been facilitating the application process uh, to the SMBs by focusing on innovation and our own digitalization for the public administration. We have worked with these uh, RP, uh, RPIs, automatic application processes, data collection from companies, AI integration in administration. So reducing administrative burden, administrative barriers, a paperless administration allows for greatest accessibility for all. So I think that, that the key message of this uh, experience so far is that a smart administration is in synergy and collaboration with the private sector, and that is the key success to allow for digital transformation of the economy. Great, thanks, Karma. And if I could just follow up to you, actually, and ask perhaps about the, uh, not necessarily blind spots, but the areas in which the Spanish government would like to do more, because, of course, we can throw money at SMEs and startups and things like that and encourage investments into next generation technologies. But what about things like bridging the connectivity divides and making sure that people have digital skills? I mean, are these important areas, too? Absolutely. We are deploying a very comprehensive program that is called the Digital Agenda, where to have like 10 big projects. Uh, one is connectivity. We are aiming to have 100% coverage, no gray areas uh, in the whole territory before 2025. We are also committed to the deployment of 5G uh, infrastructure and also a special uh, plans on the visual sector. That's the three plans are in the hands of my colleague, uh, Secretary of State of Telecommunication, and uh, our Secretary of State of Digitalization and AI is responsible for the modernization plan of the public administration, the, um, the SME digitalization plan, and as you mentioned, well, the national strategy on artificial intelligence, where we focus on artificial intelligence, quantum computing, also the data economy, where we are deploying the Gaia X chapter in, in Spain, and very specially, of course, we are responsible for the a startup law, we can talk about this later, but very importantly, what you have mentioned, their national plan for digital skills. We still have 33% of the population with no basic digital skills. And especially SMBs also need to be accompanied to adopt the skills necessary that the market already demands. And in this moment of time, we have four times more demand of skilled workforce than existing offers. So we are already deploying this national plan of digital skills starting second half of the year. 
Mm -hmm. Interesting. And some of the points you raised there, Carmen, made me think of the EU's digital compass plans for 2030, but maybe we can come back to that a bit later on. Um, Jean-David, perhaps turning to you now for a bit of a Brussels perspective here, and obviously you're representing the European Innovation Council today. Um, your body has actually come up under a bit of criticism recently from uh, certain members of the European Parliament um, who have brought to light a series of frustrations over delays with regards to getting financing and money to SMEs on the ground. And this is something that I believe the Commission itself has also um, admitted to. Can you say anything more about why these delays have actually happened and perhaps what the EIC is looking to do to remedy them? We don't seem to be able to hear you, Jean-David, perhaps the microphone. Apparently I was muted, so sorry for this. Great. Do you hear me? Yes, we do indeed. Great. No, and sorry for the noise because I am in a place where we love SMEs because I am uh, currently in VivaTech in Paris, as you know. So, um, no, uh, thanks a lot for, for the invitation and I would like to, to come immediately to, to your question. In fact, um, the, um, the European Innovation Council, to a certain extent, is victim of its success. Uh, we launched this initiative uh, as a pilot in 2019-2020 with the objective, in fact, to uh, tackle a market gap, which was this uh, difficulty of our investors um, to uh, support uh, the uh, rapid scale-up of our deep tech startup and, and SMEs. And uh, we, we launch a new initiative which has the purpose, in fact, to, for the first time, invest directly in the capital of this type of companies in 2019-2020. And by providing them blended finance uh, support, which is a mix of grant and equity. We have been able in only one year and a half uh, to um, select uh, a bit more than 140 startup and SMEs and to take decision of investments of more than 640 million euros. So it was certainly not a failure, but a, a huge success in a very short period of time. Now, when we launched uh, Horizon Europe, where the EIC became a fully fledged uh, program, uh, we had, uh, unfortunately, also to, um, to tackle um, um, a crisis of growth because to, to become such a big fund in such a short period of time required to review a number of procedures uh, regarding the way indeed we are able to uh, monitor the number of investments that we have and the number of board seats that we have already now in a number of companies. Uh, but uh, we went through this, and the good news is that yesterday in Paris we have announced the first new investment uh, in a very promising startup, which is uh, Cyperl. Cyperl is a company which is supporting, in fact, the, um, the emergence to the market uh, of uh, high-performance, low-power European micro, uh, micro, uh, micro processor, sorry, for exascale uh, supercomputing. Uh, and this is exactly in the, in the line and in the spirit of what is the purpose of the European Innovation Council, uh, which is clearly uh, to contribute to the um, technological autonomy of Europe, because you, we will not be able at the European level uh, to have an industrial autonomy if we have not a technological autonomy. Uh, and now we are back on track. You mentioned uh, the criticism of the Parliament. I would say, on the contrary, that um, Parliament is uh, very keen to support the EIC, uh, but uh, is a bit worried by a number of uh, difficult procedures that we have to, um, to tackle with and is ready to help in order to ensure that the EIC is delivering its full speed as it was already the case during the, during the pilot. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-David. There, um, You mentioned technological autonomy, technological sovereignty, these types of terms, rather nebulous in their nature, but perhaps that's something we can come to a bit later on because it's somewhat hard to define that um, terminology more, more broadly. But I'd like to bring in now Jean-Laurent Granier from uh, Generali, France. And um, Jean-Laurent, this panel is, of course, about the EU's love for SMEs. Um, but, of course, this term is also quite hard to nail down. Um, what does this love actually mean in practice? Uh, does it mean lots of money? 
Does it mean less of a regulatory burden for SMEs? Is it about, um, perhaps as uh, Jean-David seems to suggest there, is it about um, being an active market player in Europe, but also globally as well? Uh, what does the picture look like for Europe's banking and, and fintech and financial services firms? So thank you for your question. And uh, thank you for having me and the Generali group at this uh, very interesting panel uh, focused on, uh, on SMEs. I have to say that starting that uh, as a leader in uh, European insurance, uh, Generali Group is uh, particularly interested in uh, SMEs because SME is for us a very key strategic segment, very relevant to us. And it's, it is the sector where we write the majority of our B2B or corporate business contracts. We are much more focused as generally on SMEs than on uh, large uh, corporates. It represents at the scale of the Generali Group in, in Europe uh, more than uh, 4 billion euro uh, annual global turnover. And we have, for instance, uh, uh, 50,000 uh, SMEs uh, as customers uh, in France. And uh, when we take all the, the small and independent uh, units, it, it increases uh, up to uh, uh, 500,000 uh, customers. So, um, uh, in our strategy, clearly focusing on, on SMEs and being for them the, the lifetime partner is uh, something which is uh, extremely important, major in, in our uh, vision of our uh, uh, role uh, in, the, in the global economy. I have to say that we have two different roles uh, as insurer. Uh, of course, protect the activity and accompany uh, the customers in uh, maintaining, protecting their, their activity as an insurer, but also having a, a critical role in terms of uh, institutional investor. And, and those two uh, dimensions are, are coming uh, uh, together. Just to, to give you an order of magnitude, uh, we have uh, launched an initiative at group level, which is called Fenice 190. And uh, we have uh, already invested 1 billion euros dedicated to SME and real economy. And uh, in the upcoming uh, five years, we intend to, uh, to invest 3.5 billion euros more in this uh, area of uh, SMEs, digitalization, innovation, infrastructures, um, and so on. Uh, also in France, for instance, I'm in charge of Generali France, we are uh, uh, really uh, committed in all the various public private uh, fund uh, initiative la launched just after the pandemic context to support uh, recovery, uh, such as recovery loans and uh, recovery bonds that have been uh, launched by the French government, for instance, to, to, to support uh, those uh, SMEs in the post pandemic uh, crisis. And we have, you know, some uh, very uh, important initiative uh, dedicated to the uh, French tech, such as the TB uh, initiative that also we are engaged in. So uh, this is, I mean, uh, globally in terms of uh, investment, what we do and what we intend to do. Our view is that uh, uh, the regulatory framework overall and the support of the institution for SMEs has already improved, but much uh, remains to, to be done. Notably, uh, the Capital Market Union package, which has been proposed as some interesting options for, for SME, but uh, we need to uh, make easier for them to raise capital across uh, member states. Uh, also, I have to say that uh, as insurer, uh, we, we welcome the support of the European Commission intention to, to uh, uh, evolve our uh, um, uh, regulatory and uh, prudential framework solvency to revision in order to support better investment in the long term in the real economy and also to to have this coming uh, along and in coherence with the, the green and digital uh, uh, transition. Uh, in this aspect, of course, a better treatment in our uh, prudential framework, Solvency 2, of uh, long-term uh, equity investment, better capital treatment for investment in uh, uh, real economy and, and SME uh, will, be, uh, will be very important. So this love for SME has to be translated into a practical, concrete decision in order to 
uh, to ease the funding, the financing for SMEs in order to help us as institutional investors to be uh, at the forefront of this battle to provide capital and financial support for SME developing initiatives. I would like to have a word also on the ESG uh, framework uh, at large. I mean, I think that the SMEs in Europe, they have a, genu a genuine and a growing awareness of the uh, ESG uh, challenges. And they know that they will be increasingly dependent on a sound ESG reporting to secure some activities, some contracts, and some funding. So we need to incentivize those SMEs to, to make progresses, to take steps uh, uh, on, on that front. And as a group, generally has launched many initiatives in favor of the sustainable growth of SME. The most significant one is, goal, is called the initiative Enterprise that we have launched in 2021. Uh, we were in the, in the middle of, of the COVID uh, crisis and we have engaged at group level 6,000 SMEs. The idea there is to reward the SMEs that have the best uh, awareness and the best translation in concrete action of uh, sustainable uh, behavior, sustainable uh, initiative. In France, this initiative has been supported by uh, the, the Ministry of, of Finance, Mr. Bruno Le Maire, and by Mrs. Olivia Grégoire, another uh, minister that was at that time in, in charge of sustainability. And we, we want, with this initiative, to um, uh, first of all uh, recognize the effort that SME ca can do. We want to create a, a pan European platform to give visibility to sustainable SMEs, the ones that, that are fully integrated in their approach, in developing their business, this criteria, mm -hmm. this uh, um, well, awareness, let's, um, this focus let's on just, sustainability. Let's pick up your point there, John Laurent, about um, the French government's uh, enthusiasm here, obviously, for startups and SMEs. And I think this is a great opportunity to bring in Louis uh, Fleuret, Deputy Director for uh, Le French Tech here. If you are still with us, the connection's a bit shaky. Perhaps you're in Viva Tech as well. Um, ah, we don't have you here. Okay. Uh, hopefully he will come back in a moment's time. But um, I just wanted to ask, actually, following on from some of those points, um, clearly across a number of different governments um, in the European Union, there has been a concerted effort to uh, invest in SMEs and startups to compete on the global stage, and other countries have been less perhaps willing to do so. Um, Karma, should we be bringing up our startups and SMEs to be able to compete with other global firms, for example, from the United States or from China, etc., or should we be looking more to level the playing field in terms of fair competition in the internal market here? Or is this not, is this a false binary, for example? What's your take on it? First of all, of course, we need to invest in, in startups. They are the key for the future development, uh, economic sector uh, growth, and of course, uh, high qualified work skills. And this is why in Spain we have uh, we are just in the very latest phase of the parliamentary process to approve the startups law, a law that is unique because it's the first legislation that recognizes the uniqueness of these type of companies that have absolutely different dynamic of growth. They compete globally and they won. They are, attract talent globally also. And we uh, wanted to give also visibility to the startup ecosystem in Spain that already accounts for more than 10,000 startups last year, a record figure, uh, able also to mobilize more than 4 billion billion investments. So with the startup law, we want to become the top edge at the European level uh, on, on attractiveness for those entrepreneurs. Uh, we are regulating and making more fre uh, flexible, uh, flexible the activities that um, uh, startups need to correct with administration, uh, have, of course, tax benefits, uh, improved tax regime for non-resident income tax, the digital nomads visa, uh, also a special carried interest uh, treatment and stock option that was a really a long-term claim from the sector. And uh, but apart from this, we want also to invest in scale-ups. So really the problem we have in Spain is not the startups, it's the problem that those startups need to grow bigger, they go to series before where they don't have the money, not only in Spain, but also in Europe to really scale up. Is in that moment of time when we miss all the talent, when we miss all the capacity to make unicorns from Europe, because they are, I would say, cheaply sold to US, 
U.S. companies, U.S. funds, and of course, Chinese or, or Japanese funds or, or, or companies. And that is what they need to tackle. This is why we have launched a unique uh, initiative, which is the Next Tech Fund. The Next Tech Fund is a public-private fund of funds with $4 billion investment. And what we really want is to devote those investments in deep tech and deep science, really creating an ecosystem which is solid in long term, not just, I would say, um, something that creates a hype and then it can, you know, the bubble can can be punched in, in, in three years. Really want to create a new infrastructure for talent and for innovation. So we will focus on investment in deep tech and it is like AI, IoT, cloud computing, quantum blockchain, cyber security, whatever. And just in five months time, we have already announced two transactions. We have already uh, helped building up a 250 million fund with a, a national public investment of 70 million. And the second one is a 300 million fund devoted for technology for sustainability uh, that where our, our next tech fund has provided 100 million euros. And just with these two operations, we have already built the two largest uh, uh, funds in Spain to invest in deep tech. We didn't have anyone larger than 100 million. And that's already two funds at the size of 300 million. Mm -hmm. I think this uh, initiative shouldn't be an isolated initiative from Spain. Should be a coherent initiative and a coordinated initiative at the European level. This is why we are also very active in promoting this alliance called ESNA, the European Startup Nation Alliance, where Portugal, Austria, and Spain have been the founding members. But at this point of time, already France, Czech Republic, and I think Poland are joining, and also more 15 companies have have committed because that's what we are doing, like a benchmarking. We are doing a what. Uh, we are doing best, learning from the others. And through ESNA, we are already in conversations with the European Investment Fund, also under the presidency of France. There was this initiative that we are fully supporting, which is promoting the creation of a European fund of funds, aiming to boost even more the investment in the growth phase and targeting for a 1,000 million uh, uh, yes. funds size. Thank and you, I Carmen. think that's I, the, the way to, to really... Uh, Just to come in here, opinion. because yes. I'd like to bring in Jean David here, because I can see him nodding his head there gleefully at some of the things that you're saying. Um, how critical is this stage, Jean David, between startups and scale ups? And of course, coming back to your, your use of the term technological sovereignty, how much does that term play into this whole debate of creating firms that can actually compete globally in the future? No, so thanks, thanks for, for the question. Um, what, what was just said is, uh, is absolutely uh, relevant. And uh, I just would like to, um, to, to, to illustrate this by, by a number of things. If you look, for example, of the, of the top 50 companies, be it in terms of valuation or in terms of turnover, and you make a comparison between Europe and the US and Chinese, you can see two different things that are very speaking by themselves. First, the um, European companies are more or less the same than the ones that were there already 20 years ago. The American one, more than half of them have changed. The Chinese are all new. Uh, a huge majority of them are coming from uh, areas that are, uh, in fact, driven by deep tech, or at least digital. And at the end of the day, this has also a direct impact on the way we live, so on the way our society is evolving. So this is why, and I'd like there also to answer to your previous question, um, it's, uh, it's not only because we would like to... Uh, support our startup to scale up uh, for the purpose to be able to compete in a fair way, as you mentioned yourself, Samuel, at world level. It's because also in the, in the new areas that are emerging in different parts of the economy, if we are not among the leaders, I mean, this will have also an impact on the way we live in our model of society. And we have a model of society in Europe, which is common to uh, the, the European countries. And this is why I absolutely welcome what was said by the minister a few seconds ago, that by definition, because we have the same objective, because of course we have our own particularities, I mean, we should build things together. What was announced by the French presidency on the 8th of February, this idea of... Uh, 
building the foundation for 100 billion euro sovereign funds uh, is going into this direction. And this is something that evidently we can only do all together. It cannot be implemented uh, in isolation by one or another country or even less at the level of the union without uh, the involvement of each and every country. And this uh, is something that uh, could make a, a huge change because Another key dimension, which is linked uh, to the topic of, uh, of the title of your, of your session uh, on the love of startup and SMEs, uh, is also linked to the, to the problem of um, uh, how we ensure that while we provide them with means uh, in their scaling up, we are indeed tackling the capacity that these companies remain European that this technology remain European because they have otherwise, I mean, and we have uh, filled it in fact in our, in our, in our, in our flesh in the last, uh, in the last two, two years, uh, this could have a huge impact uh, on our economy, uh, on our life and society, like we, we feel it during the pandemic. If we have not this capacity of resilience, this capacity of uh, driving, in fact, uh, our own uh, autonomy, and I can speak about sovereignty, but everybody understand here, um, uh, this is a, a real issue also uh, for our citizens. So this is why, I mean, investing in technology, investing in talents, in our innovators, in our investors, uh, in, uh, in our researchers, makes a lot of sense in order to um, secure the way we live uh, in Europe uh, and uh, for the benefit of our citizens. Thank you very much, Jean-David. I am being ushered out of the session as we are, we are coming to the end of um, today's panel, but I'd just like to do a very, very quick tour de table, um, maybe with some summarising comments from uh, the three of you, uh, no more than a couple of sentences, if at all possible, uh, because we're a bit tight for time. Um, I'd like to really know more about what this love represents for you, the EU's love for startups and SMEs. What is it really about? Is it about public-private partnerships? Is it about reducing the regulatory burden? Is it about money? Or is it about, you know, exporting the EU's cultural values further and further afield? And perhaps I could turn to Jean Laurent first for your concluding remarks. For two or three sentences only, I think it's very much about fostering innovation and supporting them, uh, those SMEs and startups in the ESG awareness and transition. And just a concrete example and illustration, in the post-pandemic crisis, we as Generali, we decided to team up with three other majors, Sanofi, uh, that you, you know well, Capgemini, IT and data processing company, and Orange Telecom Company to create an accelerator for digital health startups helping them to, to get at scale, to move from startup early stage to uh, able to compete uh, new firms in Europe. This is an example of what we want to do in an area where we need to have more creativity, more enterprises, more SMEs. Great. Thank you. Karma, your concluding remarks, please. I would say that we need to work together in a coordinated way between European countries, not to be dependent on third countries in a strategic uh, subjects like digital sovereignty and technological sovereignty, but always allowing that Europe is the most attractive place, attracting talent, attracting innovation, attracting investment and competitive, but based on the respect of the European values. Great. Thank you, Karma. And uh, Jean-David. I, I will have difficulties to say better things than what was just said by the minister, but maybe I would, uh, I would insist on... Um, building a, a future which is a sustainable, resilient uh, future for our children. And in fact, this is what is at stake at the end of the day. And uh, in this context, I mean, it's clearly startups and small and medium enterprise that will play a, a key role. And it is a duty of public bodies to create the conditions for them to flourish and to bring the solution to the challenges we have. So. I think that uh, if we are able to have this objective and we are doing it all together at national level, at regional level, at EU levels, on the basis of our values, I mean, there is no reason why we should not succeed. 
Thank you very much, Jean-David. Well, we've heard about the challenges of supporting SMEs in Europe, the political and social context, the importance of quick and easy access to capital, and whether or not we should be looking to build up firms to compete on the world stage. Thank you very much indeed to our three panellists for joining us here this afternoon. And thank you also, those of you tuning in online and also those of you in person here for joining us. But don't go anywhere yet because up next we have a closing interview with Matthias Corman, Secretary General of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, who will be speaking to Politico's Paula Tama. Thank you.